There's a pretty one, Ulysses. Raymond from Maryland is back, and he's here to tell us about another interesting nonfiction book. Hello, Raymond. Hello. Good, good afternoon. Good evening. Good afternoon. Good evening. And all those whatever time zone we happen to be in, I have no idea what time it is here. So let's just carry on. You are here to talk about a very sober sounding book. It is called mm-hmm. How Civil Wars Start and How to Stop Them by, the, I believe she's a political scientist, Barbara F. Walter, just published about a month ago, early January 2022. And you, um, I don't know if like is the word, but you thought it was a good book. Yes, a very good book. And scary. Yeah. <laughs> Tell us a sure. little bit about it and why you thought so. Okay. So basically, her argument is that in 2020, she saw, 2020 and 2021, the author saw some incidents that have happened in the country in America that she saw that was very similar to events in other countries, uh, such as the Capitol riot, January 6th of 2021, and then the attempted kidnapping, well, failed kidnapping of one of a governor in the United States um, that the, I think the FBI had foiled that uh, plot. And so she saw similarities of those two incidences in other countries. And so in this book, what she's doing is she's showing how civil wars have started in other countries and then making that comparison to how it could happen in America. And uh, what are some of the major analogous examples she gives? So how she divides it up is like each chapter is a a seed, so to speak, of civil war, right? So this idea that the increased rise of factions in the country, the increased division between the rural part of the country and the urban part of the country, the rise of social media being a, a, in her words, is an accelerant to civil wars happening because it's causing people to you know, be siloed into their communities and they're only reading certain information that confirms things that they already believe in and it causes people to get agitated and lash out. And I believe that one of the examples she gives about uh, social media playing a major role is Myanmar, which I didn't know Mm -hmm. you would call a civil war, but it certainly seems like it's headed in that direction. But the the social media really played a big role there. Yeah, Um, yeah. What I've heard about this book, to correct me if I'm wrong, is that she makes quite a convincing case about w- that it's when a autocracy is starting to move towards a democracy, that that is the pivot at, at which civil war is most likely to erupt. Have I got that right? Yeah, yeah, that's correct. I misspoke a bit here. Really, the thesis or one of the theses that she's making in this book is that it's when autocracies start moving towards democracy or vice versa, when democracies start moving towards autocracy, that civil wars are most likely to break out. So now I have clarified. So can you tell us any more about that central kind of? Yeah, so for scholars like her and some others, there's this scale called the polity scale. It's a way for scholars to determine whether a government is a democratic government or or autocratic government. And then in the middle, so the scale goes from positive 10 to positive 6 is a democratic country. Negative 6 to negative 10 is an autocratic country. And in that scale in between, so negative 5 to positive 5 is an anocracy, which has elements of both a democratic government and an autocratic government. Fascinating. So, Can you say that yeah. new word? It's a new word to me. Did you say anocracy? Yeah. Yeah, anocracy, A-N-O-C-R-A-C-Y. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. And did she evaluate America on that scale, and where did she put it? She did. So this was very interesting in the book because she said that they have a score for every year for America since, I believe, 1789. Um, and so that America was technically an anocracy in, it was the 17, I had to write this one down because I forgot, 
1797 to 1800, which was the period of time when uh, there was really only one party rule. There was there was a Fairless Party, which was George Washington and John Adams Party, and there wasn't really an opposition party yet. And so the last time since 1800 was the polity score went to a anocracy level was in 2021 after the uh, Capitol insurrection. Yeah, warning sign indeed. She is a political scientist. Mm-hmm. How is the writing? Is it uh, for the layman? Was it, is it very abstruse, accessible? Yeah, it's very accessible. It's not dry at all, in my opinion. I felt like that a, she references a lot of scholarship from other people, but it's not in a way where it's, it's, it'll be like, in cer- certain cases, she'll just reference their names and say they found this, you know, in their research, but that she, you know, it doesn't go into all the minutia. Like I said, it's not dry. It's, it's entertaining read. And if you like foreign policy or, you know, international relations, that might be a benefit too. I'm blanking on the name. There is a very popular a book that came out around, I think, the, right after Trump was elected about the same kind of topic, not civil war, but about becoming an autocracy. Do you remember what that was? I think it was, I didn't read it, but it's something about how autocracy start or begin or that, that's right. okay. democracy so you, 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 die or something like that. That's yeah. right. Yeah. And I read that one and I can't remember. Snyder maybe was the author. Yeah. Timothy Snyder. I Timothy think. Snyder. Yeah. yeah. And I remember that I thought it was really good and very persuasive, but I thought this book will have absolutely no effect because the people that need to read it are not going to read it. The people mm-hmm. that read it are already think so. So what is the point? Right. Right. Does, do you feel this book has a purpose? I understand it ends on a hopeful note. Yeah, it's, um, you know, the last chapter is the typical, well, you know, this is after she pretty much scared, every, you know, the reader, right? Because uh, there was this one chapter, I don't know if it was the second to last chapter, but it was close to the end, basically where she maps out how it could happen in the U.S., And she talks about all of these secret extremist groups and what they're planning and that type of thing or could do so and so forth and so forth. So the last chapter is basically her talking about, you know, well, this is how we can rescue the country. And she gives some historical examples like Singapore and South Africa and says that they both fell into an anocracy at one point, but then pulled out of it. She goes into more detail about how that happened. But for her, it was kind of, you know, for the American context, it's all about reforming some institutions, making government more responsive to the needs of people, because that will cause people not to be disillusioned, that type of thing, be more civic uh, locally, things of that nature. There's another booktuber, a UK husband and wife team. Their channel is called Bookshanks. And Scott is the, the nerdy nonfiction reader. And he recently reviewed this book. And he said he really liked it or thought it was a good book. But he wasn't so sure about the ending or somewhere near the end where she goes off kind of in a fictional way. That's probably the chapter when she's saying how it could happen. How it could happen. And he didn't think that was as effective. Did you have any problems with that? I did not okay. because to me it was more like that that was this that was the chapter that I was literally afraid. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so if she wanted to, she may could uh take a step and do uh thriller writing if she wanted to. Okay. <laughs> and she has the bona fides, as they say, and she had uh-huh. made her case based on historical and political analysis to then right. extrapolate into the future. And that didn't bother you. No. Okay. Not no. Well, I, you have my vote. Should you ever run for office, Raymond? <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you for being a uh, knowledge and hopefulness entrepreneur on Bite Size Book Chats today. Thank you. Glad to be here again. Sarah Kay from the Netherlands, Australian in the Netherlands, also one of the fabulous co hosts of the Bookcast podcast. Have I got the name right? Bookcast Club, yep. Of Bookcast Club, which is a fabulous bookish podcast that has some uh, recent booktube content in that I'm going to be a guest 
or I will have been a guest because this episode will go up after that on her. So we, she and I have been nattering away at each other on her side, and now uh, tables are turned. Welcome back. <laughs> Kay. Thank you, Sean. It's lovely to be back. Uh, immediately after Sean's getting his revenge on me Again. immediately after I <laughs> just made him appear on my well podcast. you made a big mistake you dangled the short story collection at me at the very end of that chat and so I said I want to do a bite-sized chat about that book it is called all the acorns on the forest floor well in fact it's called on the title a novel but I guess it's in, in a link short stories by Kim Hooper yes tell us all about it okay so I read this at the beginning of the year I read it completely on a whim. I think I was about to go for a walk l- looking for an audiobook to listen to, a new one. And it was just on the my Libby app it was, as a like new release or something like that, totally random. I was just, you know, you look for it available now. And it was this one, never heard of it, didn't know the author at all, cover didn't look remotely familiar. So I just thought, I'll try it. And I loved it. I was completely blown away by it. So, yeah, as you said, it's a set of interconnected short stories, which is one of my favourite forms of fiction, actually. I love, I love, love, love I love David Mitchell and, and writers like that. Into this, I find it fascinating how people connect with each other across different areas of space and time and how you intersect with each other at these tiny points of your life and it could have a huge impact on the other person and, and whatever. So this set of short stories is mostly about parenthood and mostly motherhood. So it's a set of people trying to be parents or about to be parents or thinking about being parents, mostly women, although not all the time. And most of them are having a difficult time of it in one way or another. And it's such, I loved it because it just shows the grief that can accompany becoming a parent. So a lot of these women have lost children beforehand. So they have very mixed feelings about um, becoming pregnant again, or if they want to do it. So that the grief that can accompany having a child, the way that being pregnant can make you feel exposed. People say things to you that you, you don't, you don't want to be talking about what they want to talk about. Um, and I just thought it was brilliant. One of the things that I love the most about it is that the way that these characters can um, talk to someone else about parenthood and they would walk away thinking, oh, she was a bit gruff. Or I didn't I don't really understand why was she so mean? She was nasty. And then the next short story would go to that character and you would learn why their backstory and why they were so, you know, so brusque or whatever to the main character. So, for example, the first the first story starts with a lady in her late twenties, I think, or her early thirties, who is very, very newly pregnant and isn't telling anyone yet. And she goes to the a, a cabin in the U.S. somewhere with her partner, and they are visiting his parents or his dad and her, and his dad's wife. And the wife is very brusque to them the whole time. She's talking about mothers and and parenting in a very callous way, and she's very dismissive about people being parents. And she doesn't know that they're that they are pregnant. And the main, the woman who is pregnant is thinking, oh, why is she so awful? Like, oh, I'm very uncomfortable here. I don't like it. And then she ends up leaving feeling very put off. Like, oh, I don't, I don't think I'll tell them that I'm pregnant. I don't know why they're being like this. Yeah. And then the next story is about the mother, about the stepmother. And she come, was adopted. She didn't know she was adopted until very late in life. She was actually abandoned as a baby and her adoptive parents found her. Um, but she didn't know any of this until actually after they'd uh, passed away and she'd only very very recently found this out so she has very very mixed feelings about people being parents she she doesn't know how she feels about her what she now knows is her adoptive parents she doesn't know how she feels about her biological mother she has no idea who she is she's thinking it's really affecting her self-worth she's thinking you know why did she abandon me was there something wrong with me what were the circumstances behind this why did they never tell me and she's going through this um literally as they as these people are coming to visit her um, and then this sort of thing happens over and over again where you find people who are uh, being quite brusque about parenthood and, and why that is and their reasons for it. I thought it was fantastic. I really, really loved it. Oh, my God. It sounds like such a Sean book. So that short story cycle type of structure work really lent itself to exploring those themes and how uh, mm. misinterpretations or uh, just seeing somebody on the surface and then getting that sur- getting underneath that surface in the very next story. Do the characters that, for example, the character of the uh, young couple, younger couple who are expecting, who are pregnant, I love the way you said that. I've never heard it said that way. It's a perfect way to say it. They are pregnant. Do, <laughs> yeah. do they, do we ever see them again? Yes. Okay. So very the characters do a, recur throughout the short Completely. Story and it's a very David Mitchell 
I know it's probably a very easy comparison to everyone talks about David Mitchell, of course, when you talk about short stories, but it's a very David Mitchell type way. Like in, in six or seven stories time, the character will go into the park and say like, oh, there's those people that just had a baby and it's the people from the first story or it will be the people from the second story. So if you are keep a hold of their names, they, they all come back, but very indirectly, very discreetly. I thought it was and um, if one of them was published standalone, would it have would it work as a standalone short story? Do you think? I think so. Yeah. I don't think it would have quite the same impact because it was really about how what you think of other people. But yeah, certainly I think you could, and any order, I think you could read them in as well. Maybe the audiobook is new, but this book was published in September 2020. Okay, yeah, this is my Australian library, so perhaps yeah. it was just yeah. they just got a hold of it. And but I the never... audiobook was excellent, actually. Oh, I would recommend good. it if you're an audiobook listener. I am, and Kim Hooper um, lives in Southern California. Yeah. <laughs> had maybe surprised. three or four other books published. Never heard of her, but uh, this is a really strong recommendation. Mm. Uh, if the tables were turned, if we had been talking, if I had been talking in the previous chat about how much I love short story cycles and you had asked me, why do you love them? I would have melted into a puddle of something on the floor, but I'm <laughs> going to try to ask, ask you the same question. Why do you love short story cycles? I love thinking about how you, people affect each other's lives, right? How you can have these tiny interactions with someone else, which can have such a deep impact positive or negative right and I just I just love that I also there's a book called Storyland by Catherine McKinnon which is an Australian novel which is also interconnected short stories and that novel is about the way that it's connected is is by the land right so they're all in the same bit of land and it jumps forward in time this is the land when indigenous people completely living on it then Europeans come after Europeans and then way into the future um, and then it goes back again and it, that novel, it really made me uh, think about um, us as like these tiny little ants, right, that just live on the earth for a tiny brief period of time. Since I read that, I have become really interested in this kind of... Kind of genre, really. It's a genre. Yeah. yeah. I think it's fascinating. I have um, read some good ones over the years, too. Well, this is one of those short and sweet bite-sized chats that this series was designed to do, because I think our work here is done, Sarah. You've totally yeah. sold me and I think a whole <laughs> awesome. bunch of my readers. So thank Thanks you so, so much. much. Cool. And if anyone has any recommendations for a similar book, I would love to hear B it. Both uh, Sarah, Kay, and myself would like recommendations for short story. Link short stories in the comments below. Well, I am, I think the word is fangirling. I am fangirling over here because I have a very special guest on my channel, Marilyn Maya Mendoza, who is also a booktuber, uh, one of my favorite channels, and she is an absolute delight. She is also known as the baby, what is it? Baby Boomer Booktuber. The Say that three times. The Baby Boomer <laughs> Booktuber, and uh, she is joining us from Hawaii. Marilyn, welcome. Aloha. <laughs> Aloha to you. And you must go check out her channel because she deserves exponentially more subscribers than she has, but she is a bit of a cult uh, booktuber. <laughs> so Marilyn, tell us about your channel. I call myself the oldest booktuber. <laughs> I've been around a long time in life, so I've read a lot of books. In during my life, there was no one to talk to about books. So I, you know, now that we have the internet. I decided on my 70th birthday to start a booktube channel because every decade I like to do something special. Well, <laughs> I think if you're going to be putting out numbers like that, 70th birthday, <laughs> I'm going to need to see some ID. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, on my channel, I try to be myself. And what people think of older people, sometimes they think, you know, you have to be staid and, and not very interesting and you lost all your joie de vie. But I like to be silly because that's part of my of my personality. I'm not putting on an act, even though some, maybe some people think I do. But I was a dancer. I was on stage. So I, I, I can be an extrovert at times. But being a reader, I'm also an introvert. <laughs> I think that's why we get along so well. It's what a, what a delight to be chatting with you by Zoom today. Yes. So everybody go check out 
Marilyn Maya Mendoza's channel. You're in for a real treat if you haven't already <laughs> discovered her. And she has come on Bite Size Book Chats today to talk about a novel that sounds like such an incredibly Sean book book that I can't wait to talk to her about it. It's from the furrowed middle brow imprint of Dean Street Press. And this one is called Mrs. Lorimer's Quiet Summer by Molly Clavering. And it was originally published in 1953. So been reprinted now by Dean Street Press. Tell us about this book, Marilyn. Well, the premise is Mrs. Lorimer has grown children, four grown children, and her house is too small, but they're all coming for the summer. And obviously it turns out to be not so quiet a summer. And the other premise is that the, the house next door is the one she wants to buy, but her husband is against it. He's like a military guy, a, a retired, and he's quite interesting. He's a character, let's put it that way. And there's also a friend who uh, is actually, this is an autobiographical novel, and Molly Clavering is actually Gray, the friend. And Lucy Lorimer is really D.E. Stevenson who's a more famous author. And she says this in the book that Lucy is, you know, she has saleability, as she puts it. So uh, it's real, you know, because Molly Clavering did have four children. I read about it and she did. And this is post-war. Molly Clavering, who is Grace in the book, (laughs) or Gray, uh, moves next door and she's been battered by the war. Lucy is a very reserved person. And her friend isn't, but they get along and they're able to really communicate where she's not able to show her true feelings. And I call her a repressed, not quiet. That's the way I saw her. But as you get into the book, you really get to really understand the time and why she's so reserved and things ensue from there. Okay. There's romance with her son. (laughs) And the setting is important. Tell us about the setting. Yes. Well, in real life, Molly Clavering, she was single. She never married. And she was a Girl Scout leader, what they call the Girl Guides in real life. She loved nature. Her father had taught her so much about nature. So there's beautiful nature settings in the book. And are we in uh, Yeah. uh, I'm not drawn to setting that much unless it's really done well and done, shall we say, not too much. (laughs) So, um, okay, here it is. The ground far and near was covered by the glowing mantle of Heather in full bloom. The air was sweet with its honey scent and loud with the bees busy plundering its sweetness. Above arched the faint blue of the sky and all over lay the lovely clear champagne colored light of afternoon. Mm. I thought that was done very well. Uh, There's only one other setting in the book and that was also done very well. But uh, But we're in Scotland, right? We're in the borders uh, between Scotland and England, and it's uh, um, they call it the borders. And the town is Moffat. And I looked it up, and it's in the southeast part of Scotland. And also the way they have this sweet friendship. And uh, she's able, she's the only one really able to bring out the character of Lucy Larmer. Okay. And both authors in real life were Scottish. I'm just looking it up. D.E. Stevenson, born in Edinburgh, and Molly Clavering, born in Glasgow. And they knew each other before the war, and uh, Molly Clavering moved to Moffat. Yes. So uh, they mentioned this in the book, that, well, you've been battered by the war, or uh, I think she was uh, part of the military, the women's, I don't know what they call it, but she, in real life. I think it's called the Wrens, and I know about the Wrens a little bit because Barbara Pym was also in the Wrens. So I wonder. And this is why you're going to love this book. Oh, it sounds quite <laughs> Pymian. It really is. It really is. It in a more happy ending kind of way, mm-hmm. you know. But what I liked about it was that the characters, and there's a lot of them because she has four grown children that uh, visit with their children. Every character is so well defined. That you don't get lost. 
So I really enjoyed that. That's important to me as a reader. And I'm curious to tell us without going into what we've already covered, what's a spoiler and what's not. But in the synopsis, it says that the Lucy character, and that's the one modeled on D.E. Stevenson, she has a large family. And the premise, as you've said, it's there's a, she wants to have a summer reunion with her family. Yes. Yes. Her daughter-in-law sounds fascinating. Her daughter-in-law is described in the synopsis as being restless with mundane married life after flying planes in the war. She's an interesting character, too, because Thomas is her husband, which is uh, Mrs. Lorimer's son. And she, she, the whole book, she's worried about all her children and trying to fix uh, Mrs. Lorimer, all their problems. And uh, what the character you mentioned her problem is she's not taking care of Thomas well enough. <laughs> she's not that type of housekeeper. So, so uh, Thomas is looking kind of thin. <laughs> so she, you know, she's trying to figure out a way to fix that problem in addition to all the other problems that, ha- that pop up that summer. This is a character-driven novel. It's not a plotty novel, but she does it so well that there are little plots in the story that get tied up. But you have done a fabulous job of selling it to us. So, Marilyn, thank you so much. Thank you, Sean. Alex is back joining us from Hamilton, Ontario, the fabulous host of the fabulous book podcast from the Hamilton Review of Books. There'll be a link to all of the information you need about that, as I am a regular listener and I urge you to do to become one yourself. Alex, welcome back. Hey, great to be back. Yeah, lots changed. I think we... We had been talking about launching the podcast and I had nice. given you some de- uh, details, but now we've done three episodes and yes. I think they're, they're going quite well. Yeah. Okay. L- when's the next one coming out? Uh, I'm recording it next week. It's actually, uh, we're going to be talking about um, works in translation okay. and uh, my guest is going to be Barbara Halla, who I think a lot of people know from Twitter or she is an editor for one online literary magazine and we've conversed a lot online and mostly about translated literature so that should be a great pick and looking awesome. forward to that so and we should have it up probably in the next few weeks okay and probably around the same time that this episode but i'll certainly get oh great a yeah, yeah, yeah link to the specific episode if it's already gone live great and then speaking of translated literature we are here to talk about a work of translated literature that you recently read and loved nervous system yeah. by yes. luna merwong if i'm pronouncing yeah. it correctly and translated from the spanish by megan mcdowell and i will let you tell us all about it i picked it up because it's one of the tournament of books finalists i guess there's 17 or 18 books and i'm not sure if you've ever followed the tournament of books i i don't do it every year Vaguely. it depends it depends if i'm interested and just if, if folks want to know what it is effectively mm-hmm. they they mimic the format of college basketball competitions and tournaments and part of it's kind of like poking fun at the absurdity of books going head to head against one another but often they're they're really good about like you know you have some big names there but there's always like some you know hidden gems that they help bring to light and this was one of them it's a nice short book called nervous systems as you you mentioned and what really i found quite amazing about it and I'll get to the plot in a second because it's it's not a, a super plot driven novel it's very much a language driven novel and the story follows the main character her name is Ella ironically her partner's name is L so this just tells you some of the the word the language play because it's just a yeah and and L like he and her and all the characters have these very generic names the father is father the step siblings are step siblings mother is mother so there's no like individualization there's these very generic uh, characters uh you kind of like that because i don't have to remember a bunch of names so that no makes- for sure right she tells you who they are every time they they come up you know? and i was remiss when i mentioned it not to mention that the author uh lena melwan Mer- 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 is Mer- Wong, yeah. chilean chilean yes so i uh, my background is chilean my parents are chilean and i i, I could read in spanish but probably not the kinds of texts in, in literary fiction. Uh, Ella is a astrophysicist who's in school trying to get her PhD. Uh, so on the one hand, there's at the beginning, this she's someone who wants to explore outer space, but the novel is 
completely an exploration of inner space. And she spends time obsessing about her health, her family's health, and the whole interactions that happen in the book are coded through medical diagnosis and discussions about physiology and so she is a failure in her job in her academic career she can't finish her phd her father has uh, emptied his bank account to fund her phd because she wasn't talented enough to get even funding to do it in some foreign country Mm. and the father hasn't told stepmom or step siblings, he's bankrupted himself, and, oh my and she has failed. Yeah, so there, there is a melodrama to it, uh, but also then, you know, in in the midst of her having some guilt and not wanting to communicate with her father, uh, starts uh, experiencing uh, a mysterious illness, and then she obviously it turns into this obsession with uh, symptoms and and her father, who's a doctor, trying to like contradict the doctors who are seeing her and then the father becomes sick and so she has to return to uh, to Chile to be with him and to to also re-engage continue to engage in the language of diagnosis and illness so that's really like the the broad stroke of it what I found really fascinating is that I'm usually not super enthusiastic about some of these more experimental approaches to language, but I found it almost to a degree fun and fascinating uh, to see how she just intertwined medical language into literary fiction. Uh, and and I think that it, it really was captivating throughout. It's a pretty short novel. I think it's less than 200 pages or maybe slightly more. You're drawn by the the language. And I find it's quite in terms of translation, you know, translations aren't always great, uh, and you can tell when something is being translated. But here, I found I, I admire the ability to be able to to transport the the word play and the use of very specific vocabulary into a different language, and then manage to keep the flow of the the prose. So, yeah, I was I was quite impressed. Megan McDowell is a renowned translator of literature from this part of the world, from a Spanish uh, to English translation. And I have to admit at this point and embarrass myself, I guess, in a way that I tried her penultimate novel to be translated, uh, Seeing Red, which was about a young woman going blind. And I loved the premise, but I just didn't get along with Couldn't get into writing. It. I now realize that uh, maybe I, maybe uh, this was about five or five, six years ago, maybe I should give it another try because I always try to give authors two chances. And sometimes I'm, I, I'm a glutton for punishment and I keep on giving authors chances when it, when it's pretty clear that their prose just isn't jiving with me. Ian McEwen would be one of these folks oh, that I keep on going to him and he tricked you with atonement being so wonderful and then everything else I probably just found a bit it hasn't worked for me <laughs> uh, but yeah so I try to give authors at least two chances well seeing red was a much loved book and a lot of my uh, when I say I'm embarrassing myself a lot of my bookish mm-hmm. besties and Bookish besties that didn't know me back then will be horrified to hear me say that I bailed on that. Uh, I read half of it and couldn't finish. In the synopsis, it talks about the country of the present and the country of the past. Does that resonate for you? Can so you I, I, say more about that? So, you know, I, I didn't pick up some of the historical cues as I was reading. I did read some uh, reviews and and there seems to be some In the backdrop, there is the the dictatorship in Chile, and she appears to be in exile, and her inability to just go back home when the father is sick and then having to go through loopholes to do so seems to be in that backdrop. So obviously that's something I would, um, because my parents similarly had to leave uh, during the dictatorship. So I, I would have appreciated that to have been more front and center. And it really seems to have been in the background more than a part of the, the conscious discussions that are going on. Yeah. Okay. And then the country of the present would be where, where she's living. Is it, do we know where she? No, it's in, again, she's plays with mystery. She doesn't want to give country too much present, detail where all. she's at. Yeah. Presumably somewhere in the West where she's studying she does have to go back to to deal with her father's illness and and it, it forces her to confront uh, her feelings in a way that, that she had been avoiding right she 
She avoids her conversations with her father prior. She doesn't want to talk about her failed academic career. She doesn't want to talk about her her aspirations or lack thereof. And so in, in many senses, there's the sense that she has to uh, begin being more honest with those around her, including her father. Well, that does sound like it has the potential to be very poignant. Alex, this sounds great. I will give it a try, but I might go back and try seeing Red again first to see if I'm no, for sure, a right? bad, yeah. bad reading week or month when I didn't get along with it because it was five or six years ago. And I think there's a lot of books that I liked from back then that I might not like anymore. So I, I, I and, yeah, and vice versa. Yeah, yeah. So Alex, thank you very much. No worries. My pleasure.